All right, uh, tonight we come to the uh, third and final pastoral letter, a letter to Titus. It's not the last of Paul's letters, but it is the last of the, the pastoral letters, or what we call the pastoral epistles. And so First and Second Timothy were letters to the young pastor Timothy. Titus is a young pastor who's been left on an island to do some things, and Paul will, will give us some insight there. You can follow along with your notes. This was written in the, the, the late 50s, most likely. And the theme of Titus is teach, teaching. That's, that's really Paul's whole concern, that churches get good teaching, that they get right teaching, that they get Bible teaching. And that has shown up, if you, if you can think back over uh, all of our time with Paul, which is, including this one, has been 12 letters so far, that is an issue in almost every single church. That there's not one church where teaching is not a big deal. And there's not really one church where teaching is not the main deal. So Paul, over and over and over again, has really driven home problems in churches arise when teachers of the Bible depart from teaching the Bible and teach something else. They might teach a biblical, a Bible-sounding lesson or a Bible-sounding message, but it's not from the Scriptures. It's either the gospel plus something or it's something contradicting the Bible. And so in Titus, Paul is instructing this young man, Titus, or well, I shouldn't say young man. We really don't know how old Titus is. He's instructing Titus on how to lead the churches on the island of Crete. But in God's kindness to us, Paul is instructing the church today on how we should think about teaching, on how we should think about church leadership. And so you can see there in Titus chapter 1, Paul opens it this way. He says, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ for the sake of the faith of God's elect, their knowledge of the truth which accords with godliness in hope of eternal life, who, which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began and at the proper time manifested, it, manifested in his word through the preaching with which I have been entrusted by the command of God, our Savior. To Titus, my true child, in a common faith, grace and, grace and peace to you, from God the Father and the Lord, and <laughs> tongue-tied. Grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus, our Savior. So if you want to know what those four verses mean, come back Sunday, because we're going to start studying through Titus verse by verse, just like we did with Mark. We'll start that on Sunday and spend a, a good long time because I hope at the end of this evening, which again, I'll inevitably run out of time, but at the end of this evening, I hope you have a taste of, we need to hear more of this. We need to really press in and hear what is Titus, what is Paul saying to us in this letter to Titus? But like I said, the message is teach right doctrine to everyone and then live by it. Get it right and then keep getting it right. That's the message. That's the message to the church. And so uh, the message of Titus is all about the true message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so according to Paul's instruction, the primary means, the, it, it, it primarily means getting trustworthy teachers in place who will lead and oversee from the word of God. So how is it that churches can ensure they have solid teaching? Paul says it's by getting solid teachers in place. That's the main way that churches guard this essential thing that is right teaching of the Word of God. You can find people peddling Bible teaching all over. You can find it in every shape, every size, every flavor that you want. But Paul says make sure it's right Bible teaching. Make sure it's right Bible teaching. And the way, we, the way a church does that is to get right Bible teachers in place, and thanks be to God that he tells us who those men are. He explains that very clearly in places like Titus chapter 1. So he says, get good teachers in place, and then spend your life teaching the truth. Uh, Crete is an island in the Mediterranean, so it's about 100 miles south of Greece, and it's approximately 3,200 square miles just to put some perspective there, North Carolina is 52,000 square miles. And so it's a small little island. But today, uh, almost 700,000 people live on the island. So I mean, it's not a super small place, but it is a small place. But it's big enough to have a bunch of churches on it. And so Paul says to Titus, 
I'm leaving you there to minister among the churches. Not the church, singular, but churches, plural. There was more than one, probably several, on the island. Um, we don't know much about Paul's ministry there, uh, other than that it had begun at some point, and there were things left unfinished. And we know that because in Titus chapter 1, verse 5, Paul says, Titus, this is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained into order. So there were things undone. And uh, Paul has had other places like this. If you remember uh, the Thessalonian church, Paul got ran out of Thessalonica pretty quickly. He was only there a couple of months at most. And he says, I long to return to you. I long to finish teaching you the fullness of the Christian faith. And so here again, things were left undone in Crete. And so Titus has been commissioned to go back and to finish that, that work. And so here's some things, uh, two primary things. I've already mentioned it, good teaching, good teachers, and then good teaching. Paul starts off with get good teachers in place. And so that's just where he begins right off the bat, which is telling because this is one of the, the, really the primary emphasis of the letter that, that Titus has work to do. And the first thing he is to do is to get leaders in place. Look at chapter one, verse five again. He says, this is why I've left you in Crete so that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. If anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife and his children are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. For an overseer, as God's steward, must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain, but hospitable, lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he might be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. And so Paul says to Titus, your first work, your primary work is to appoint elders in every town, Paul says, as I have directed you. So he says to, to, to get those leaders in place. And he says, get them in place, but make sure they're qualified. He says in verse 5, appoint elders in every town as I directed you, if anyone is above reproach. And he lists these qualifications. And so after instructing Titus to appoint elders, Paul then gives the explicit qualifications for, for who these men are to be or what they're to look like. And notice, I said last week, anytime, uh, almost any time, in the 66 times the word elder shows up in the New Testament, it's almost always plural. It's almost always plural. Uh, it's singular in 1 Timothy 3 when it says the qualifications of the office of overseer, which we talked about was another word for elder or pastor, that's singular because it's talking about the qualifications of an individual. But every, else, every other place that it's mentioned, especially when it's talking about a church, it's always in the plural. Just like Paul says to, to Titus, appoint elders in every town. So the church in every town and in every church, there should be a plural number of these men, these overseers of God's church. And just as a reminder, we talked about how there's three terms for this office in the New Testament. There's elder, which is the most common. Then there's overseer, uh, which is mentioned five times. And then there's the word pastor, which is mentioned once in Ephesians 4. And, and the way I kind of explain that is uh, the elder, that's his title. His job is to oversee the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the way he does that is through pastoring or teaching. So you see how all three of those, are they refer to the same office and they just come at it from different different angles. But Paul gives 15 specific qualifications for who an elder is to be. And they break into fairly neat categories and give us insight into the kind of man that can occupy uh, the office of elder. So in chapter 1, verse 6, Paul says that the measure of a man's leadership is demonstrated in his home. Not that a me the measure of a man's leadership can be demonstrated in his home, Paul explicitly says, look into the man's home. Look in there. Which means that an elder has to be opened to being examined. Some people are very shut off in their homes because of what goes on in their homes. 
Some people leave, live one way outside and then they have a different home life and a lot of people want to keep that hidden because it doesn't accord. But an elder has to be willing to have his front door thrown open and his life put on display so that he is deemed equipped or not. Because the way a man loves his wife and parents his children is indicative of whether he can lead the church or not. That's what Paul's saying. It's a big deal. Look at the man's life. Look at his home. The way he treats and leads his family will tell a church how he ultimately will treat and lead them. In most places you, that you go to work, it does not matter who you are at home. It does not matter the status of your home or what's going on at home. Most places want to know, can you do the job? But here in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, God says, it matters more than you can imagine who the man is at home because who he is at home will inevitably become who he is in the office of elder. And so it says, look at how he treats his wife. Look at how he treats his children. What kind of a husband, what kind of a father is he? Now, we need to understand Paul's not being literal. He's not saying uh, with this qualification, the husband of one wife, that an elder has to be married. That, that, would, be, um, that would be putting something onto the text that's just not there. Because Paul doesn't give any of these specific line item qualifications like he's got to have, he has to be married, he has to wear red, he has to drive this kind of car. That's not what he's saying. He's talking about the character of a man. Just like in 1 Timothy chapter 3 when it lays out the qualifications for an elder and a deacon, it's all about the qualifications of his character. There's only one skill given for an elder and that's he has to be able to teach. But his teaching is tied to his character. And so even if an elder isn't married, you can still observe his home life. He still will have a family. You won't be able to measure it as much, which is why throughout church history and now most elders are married. But if that's true, if elders had to be married, then Paul was disqualified. Jesus would not have been able to serve as a pastor in our churches. And so Paul's not given a literal line item. He has to be married. He's saying, look at the man's quality of character. How does he treat his family? Because the way he leads his home is the way he will lead the church. Furthermore, understanding what Paul is getting at, which is, again is a character, the emphasis is, not, is also not on an elder having never been divorced. For a long time, Baptists have, seen, have, have looked at divorce as the unpardonable sin when it comes to the offices of pastor and deacon, but that's just not in the qualifications, either in 1 Timothy 3 or in Titus. Now, divorce is not a small issue, and it should never be passed over. It should be looked into very specifically in every single case. But there have been pastors, I know of a seminary professor of mine, that is divorced because his wife abandoned him. So it was no fault of his own in this particular case, and so Paul's not saying divorce equals always condemned, always shut out. But what Paul is saying is, look at the man's character. Look at the man's character. Which again, just like most elders will have a family, be married and have children, most elders will have never been divorced. There will be exceptions, but m the rule across the board is that most of them will fall into those categories, married and never having been divorced. Paul's emphasis, as I said, is on the elder's faithfulness, not on nitpicky law-keeping, which, again, Jesus combats that all the time throughout the Gospels. Paul says, look at the man's character. Uh, you, can have, um, you can have a man who's been divorced for an innocent reason be of stellar character and a man who's never been divorced and be a scumbag. It's just the truth, which is why Paul says, don't look at these rules. Look at the character behind the rules and then uh, understand the rules in light of the character. And so Paul says, look at the man's family. Look at the man's family. Um. He goes on to say, look at the elder's children. 
If anyone uh, is above reproach, the husband of one wife and his children are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. And so, uh, again, the implication is not um, an elder must have children. Uh, because there are, there are men who faithfully serve in this office who never have children. Again, Paul and Jesus would fall into that, that category. But, again, most elders will have children. And so Paul says, look at the behavior of his children. Look at how he parents, but also look at the effect of his parenting in the lives of his children. And Paul says, you can measure his qualification in his children. Now, it's important that we understand a word here. Because Paul says, it's, it's translated in the English Standard Version, that his children be believers. It's translated in that same word in the New American Standard, also in uh, the, the New International Version. But in the New King James, the New King James translates it, having faithful children. And then, no doubt in your Bible, if it says believers, it has a footnote that says faithful at the bottom. Because the word in the Greek word is the word for faith. And so then we have to step back and do some theological understanding. What's Paul saying? Because it would be totally out of step with everything that Paul says in the rest of his letters to say, an elder is only qualified if his children have accepted Jesus. Because then that puts the emphasis on the elder's ability to save his children. And that would be totally contradictory to everything Paul's already said in Romans and First and Second Corinthians and Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. And so we need to, we need to step back and say, what, what is Paul intending by using this word for faith? And the implication that fits better is that his children are faithful to him. And so the Greek word, which is faith or believe, also means, as I said, faithful. And so that means his children aren't uh, he, he, hasn't, he hasn't led his home in such a way to where his children want to get away from him. He hasn't led his, his home in such a way to where his family is in disarray. His qualifications to lead the church are present in his home, and his home flourishes because he is a faithful man. Not that his children are believers, but that his home is faithful because he leads in a godly way. He goes on to say that his children should not be open to the charge of debauchery and insubordination, which fits with that understanding of children being faithful. So an elder's leadership of his children will result not in perfect children, because if that's the case, y'all, I have failed. <laughs> an elder must not have perfect children. An elder must have a faithful home to where his godly leadership is evidenced in his home and in his children. I highlighted it there. Paul is saying, a man who can't lead his home can't lead the church. Plain and simple. We've talked about how the office of elder has authority vested in it from Scripture. And Paul says one of the ways you can, you can trust a man installed in that office is that if he's qualified, you can see it on display in every area of his life. But if he can't lead his home, he's not going to lead the church. He might occupy the office, but he can't lead the church. So Paul says, look at the man's home. But he also says, look at the man's relationship with other people. In verses 7 and 8, he says, an overseer. So there again, you see that other word, right? He said in verse 5, appoint elders. And then he starts giving qualifications. And then he changes the title to overseer, right? Same, same office, different word. For an overseer as God's steward must be above reproach, must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard, or violent, or greedy for gain, but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. So Paul starts off by saying, the man, there are several things about the man that can't be true. If he's going to be an elder, there are several things that cannot be true. He says an elder cannot be overbearing, he can't be arrogant. That's unbecoming of, of the office of elder. It does not fit with the role and the calling of an elder for someone to be arrogant or overbearing, quick-tempered, easily angered, those are disqualifying for the office because elders often find themselves in angering situations. I don't know if y'all know this or not. People are difficult. People can be difficult. 
And by the nature of the calling of the elder, he gets put into situations that are hard, that are messy, that involve struggle, that involve emotion, that involve tension. And so if a man is quick to anger, he's not fit for the office because if you can't control your temper, then you're just going to explode all the time. And an elder can't do that because an elder must be able to give the word of God in godly ways. But if he's quick to anger, he's disqualified. He must be in control of his anger. Paul says an elder uh, must not be a drunk. He must not be violent. Uh, the, the New King James says one who strikes, physically punches. And those two things go together, don't they? Uh, typically, uh, drunkenness and violence tend to go together. And Paul says, "One, he, the, the man can't have um, uh, the man can't have self harming addictions. That man is under control of something that harms him and leads him to be a drunkard or violent. Then he's disqualified because it's not godly. It's, it will it will prevent him from being all that he needs to be." Paul says, "An elder can't be greedy." He cannot pursue dishonest gain, which is what was happening here in Titus with false teachers. We saw that in 2 Corinthians when Paul addressed the super apostles that were trying to impress all the rich folks. He says that, that disqualifies a man. But then he gives positive things. He says an elder must love what is good. An elder must approve of what God approves. Uh, they should say deny what God denies. An elder must hold fast to the word of God and preach it and teach it and live it. It says he must be blameless or above reproach, which again does not mean perfection. An elder must not be perfect because there'd be no elders if that were the case. But he must have a lifestyle that is above reproach. He must have a lifestyle that is respectable. He must have a way of living that is attractive, that makes Jesus look good, that does not cast shame on the gospel, on the church, because in places like Hebrews 13, the church is commanded Consider those who teach you the word, talking about elders. It says, consider the outcome of the way that they live and then imitate them. And so because elders are, are required to be godly and have a life above questioning, that doesn't mean they're above being questioned, but they should be as a whole godly all around. The outcome of their way of living should be good. They should have good marriages. They should have faithful children, not perfect children faithful children. Their life should be attractive. And Paul says if that's, 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 what sh that's the qualification of, of holding this office in a positive way. He must approve what is good, be above reproach. Final thing he says is an elder must stand firm in the truth and for the truth. Verse number nine, he must hold firm to the trustworthy word, must be able to give instruction in sound doctrine, and to rebuke those who contradict it. So an elder must stand firm in the truth, he must teach the truth, and then he must also rebuke those who contradict the truth, which is what Paul will tell Titus you have to do. You have to contradict the false teachers that have shown up in Crete and are leading the church astray. Paul does this himself in Corinth. Paul uh, comes down hard on the churches in Galatia because they have departed at the leading of false teachers. He gets on the Thessalonian church because they too have begun to listen to false teachers. And so it's not that Paul is just this overbearing person. Paul is an elder in the church of God and he is contradicting and rebuking false teaching because of how damaging and how deadly it is for a church. And so an elder must be a man of courage in order to stand up against false teachers, but he must not be a man who's arrogant and overbearing and angry. If you remember, Jesus said, speak the truth in love. It takes, it takes humility to be loving, and it takes courage to be truthful. And Paul says, if a man's going to stand in that office and execute it faithfully, he's got to stand firmly and courageously on the word while giving it in godly, calm, humble ways. So those are the qualifications for being an elder. He talks about how we should install elders in the life of the local church. We believe in, in a doctrine called the authority of the Bible, which means uh, one, one theologian defines it this way. Uh, the authority of the Bible means that to disbelieve or disobey Scripture is to disbelieve or disobey God himself. 
And so we see there that elders, as Paul explains them in the pastoral letters, that's the expectation, that's the norm for every New Testament church. So every New Testament church should align itself with what we see here laid out in Scripture about leadership, both in the structure and in the quality of their leaders. And so Paul's instructions to Titus in chapter 1, verse 5, indicate that every church should have a plural nature of elder, a plural number of elders. It's too big a job for one man. It's too much authority for one man. Uh, I, I firmly, and I, th- I think I've said this before, I firmly disagree with the title senior pastor because A, it's, it's only in the Bible once and it's only in the Bible in reference to Jesus. But other than that, there is no ranking among pastors. It says uh, the, only, the only time senior pastor shows up in the Bible is in 1 Peter 5, talking about Jesus, where Peter calls him the chief shepherd. Talked about how pastoring means shepherding or teaching. The chief pastor, the senior pastor is Jesus. And every other pastor stands shoulder to shoulder, having been qualified through Scripture and installed by a local church to lead well. Now, that doesn't mean there won't be distinctions. God gifts elders, pastors differently. So there will be churches where you have a pastor who does the bulk of the teaching and a pastor who might do the bulk of the discipling ministry, a pastor who does counseling or a pastor who does this, that, or the other. That doesn't mean that every church has to pay all those people. If you remember, we talked about that in um, 1 Timothy 5, Paul says there, there ought to be a number of elders And the ones who labor in preaching and teaching are worthy to be employed. So not all, not every church is going to have five paid pastors. But the norm in every church in the New Testament is that there will be multiple qualified men, at least two, serving in this office. Because that's that's the norm. Every time it comes up, it's always in the plural. And it indicates that they're appointed to that office. That they are no, that they are recognized, examined, and then installed. To a point there means kind of like our word ordain. To ordain a man into the office, to set him apart after a rigorous process to be installed in that office. So uh, we should note the priority that Paul gives to this. This is project number one for Titus. When he gets to Crete, with all the problems, Paul says, devote yourself to this because nothing else will get into order until you get leadership right. And if you serve in any kind of leadership capacity anywhere, you know how important that is. You can't fix the bottom stuff if the top stuff is broken. If your leadership is bad, everything else is going to be affected by that. And so it's project number one, Paul says, church, get qualified elders in place. Here we can draw on this, this particular study that we've been going through uh, for a long time now. I don't know how long. <laughs> but just remember the history of Israel. How bad did Israel suffer over and over and over again because they got a bad leader? A bad leader arose, led the people astray, and they got punished. A good leader would come back. And, you know, it doesn't really elaborate. I'd love to talk to some of these guys in heaven because it says, you know, like uh, King Josiah arose and he tore down the high places that his father had built. That had to take some time and tick some people off. You know, in Baptist life, he came in and just, he just threw out some traditions. He dismissed some committees. He did away with some programs. Didn't ask anybody, just did it. I just like to talk to some of these guys because, man, they were courageous. But when bad leaders get in charge of God's people, bad things happen to God's people. But when good leaders get in charge of God's people, good things happen. Which is why Paul says to Titus, devote yourself first and foremost to getting leaders in place, getting qualified leaders in place. But then he says, get the teachers in place and then teach the truth. Get them in their place and then let them do what they do. Teach the truth. And he indicates two people, two groups of people that Titus is to focus on. Titus is to focus on teaching the false teachers, which that just sounds entirely unappealing to me. Somebody says to you, you know, look, there's some false teachers leading people astray. You go there and teach them the right way. But then he's to teach the faithful, the actual Christians in the churches. So Titus has a job and he's to be courageous because he's qualified. He's qualified to give instruction in sound doctrine to rebuke those who contradict it. And so he's to do that. He's to re- rebuke 
false teaching, and then teach what is right. And so after appointing elders in every churches, Titus, according to Paul, is to oppose what is false, which Paul says that's the job of an elder, oppose what's false. Listen to what he says in chapter 1, verse 10. He says, there are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers and deceivers. Now, let me back up because verse 9 gives us the context for verse 10. He says, rebuke those who contradict the truth because for there are many who are insubordinate empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision party or the Jews. They must be silenced. Did you hear that? He doesn't say reason with them or just let them finish their teaching term or whatever. He says, shut them up. What they're doing is deadly. It's wrong. They must be silenced since they are upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain what they ought not teach. One of the Cretans, a prophet of their own, said Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. He says, one of y'all's own people says this, and then Paul comes along and says, this testimony's true. Y'all are that way. He says, therefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. Think about that. An elder in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, when he comes up against false teaching, is to rebuke sharply Paul doesn't say beat around the bush. Paul doesn't say dress it up real pretty. He says rebuke them sharply. Why? That they might be sound in the faith. They're erring. They're going the wrong way. Cut them deep so they don't keep going the way of death. Rebuke sharply to correct the course. So they might be sound in the faith, not devoting themselves to Jewish myths, to the commands of people who turn away from the truth. To be pure, all things are pure, but to the undefiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But both their minds and their consciences are defiled. Listen to this. They profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. They're detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good works. So Paul says to Titus, you have to rebuke them. You have to silence them because they're unfit. They're disruptive in the church. But listen to what he says. They're hard to identify. Again, we think, we think we can identify bad people because we just have in our minds this belief, well, I can spot a bad person. On Tuesday, we hosted a human trafficking event. And one of the most shocking statistics to me was the average person that is trafficked is trafficked by an immediate family member. We have it in our heads that we can probably spot bad people, but we can't. And the same is true in the church. Paul says, you're not going to be readily seeing these false teachers. Why? Because in verse 16, they will profess to know God. They will tell you, I'm a Christian. They will teach, they will have their Bibles. They will participate in church things. They will give off the image, I'm a good church person. And I would say probably wrongly, a lot of churches today will just give somebody the benefit of the doubt if they say they're a Christian. But Paul says we ought not do that. We ought not welcome people into the membership of a, of a church or put them into an office of authority in the church without vetting them. Do you hold to the mysteries of the faith? Are you faithfully walking with the Lord? Because he says false teachers will tell you they know God, but at the same time, Paul says, look at how they live because their lives will deny what they say. It's not that hard. Judge them. That's what he says. (laughs) Be judgmental. We talked about that in 1 Corinthians 5. Paul says, I have nothing to do with judging outsiders. That's God's job. Paul says, I have everything to do with judging my fellow members inside the church. 1 Corinthians 5, verse 13, if you want to look it up. So he says here, just because somebody professes to know God does not mean that they do. Look at how they live, which should sound very familiar. Because what has Paul just told us to do with our elders? Look at how they live. Hear what they teach. But more importantly, look at how they live. As a matter of fact, don't listen to them teach before you look at how they live is what he said. If anyone meets the qualifications, then let him be installed and teach. One pastor says this. 
One of the most important things that any pastor or elder will do for you is something that you may never notice. It's not visiting hospitals. It's not successfully leading a church to expand a budget or ensuring that his sermons have clear outlines, all of which are good things. Most important thing that an elder can do for you is this, working hard to know the scripture in order to protect you from false teaching, which is useless, of no benefit, dangerous, and divisive. That's one of the primary tasks, job descriptions, duties of the elder, is to know the scripture so well that contradictions are spotted and dealt with so that the church is not harmed. Because when you get bad leaders in the church, it's bad news for the church. Which is why project number one for Titus is to appoint good leaders. And then he says, after you deal with the false teachers, then begin to teach the true believers. He says this in chapter two, verse one. As for you, Titus, teach what accords with sound doctrine. Teach what accords with sound doctrine. Remember what Paul tells Timothy, who's the pastor of the Ephesian church. In 1 Timothy 4, verse 16, Paul says to Timothy, devote yourself, or watch yourself, your life and the teachings, and devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture. Timothy's job is to guard the teaching. Titus' job is to teach what accords with sound doctrine, whole doctrine. He's to teach the Bible as God intends it to be taught. And then he's to teach several several groups of people. And the first thing he, the first group he addresses is old men. It's not, it's not bad to be old. It's not. Tim Gillum's laughing at me. It's not. Because if you are old, older, or aging, there's a job for you in the church. There's a crucial job for older people in the church. Listen to what Paul says. Older men, you're to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. Paul says this. If you're an older man, at this point in your life, your faith, your love, your endurance, they're to be evidently strong. That has nothing to do with the abilities of your body. You might be tired, you might be sick, you might not be able to get around or do as much as you did at one point. Paul says, that's not what's important. What's important, older men, is that you put the faith of Jesus Christ on display. One pastor said about this, your spirit, older men, is to be exemplary. You've had decades to work on this. If you've walked with Jesus for a long time, you ought to be one of the heroes of the church because you put it on display. He next speaks to older women. Chapter 2, verse 3, older women likewise, reverent behavior, not slanderers, not slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good, so train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind, submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. And so again, it's not bad to be an old woman. It's not. It's a God-given stage of life. And God says, you don't get put on the shelf. I remember having a conversation with an older gentleman who was in a Bible study with me one time. And he says, I'm so afraid of being put on the shelf. I've worked so hard my life. I don't want to be shoved on a shelf. And Paul says right here, if you're old, you have a big job to do. You have a big job to entrust the faith to the generations that are coming. And specifically to the ladies. Paul says, like the older men, you're to be developed in your faith and to teach the younger women how to be godly and how to obey the word of God. This is a quote I found particularly well stated. Older ladies, Titus charges you, or Paul charges you, with teaching younger women to love their husbands, love their children, be self-controlled, pure, busy working at home, to be kind, subject to their own husbands. He says, or did you think that the manner in which the younger ladies in the church live is none of your business? <laughs> because according to Titus, their lives are your business. We're afraid of offending people. We're afraid of, uh, of letting people into our lives because of how messy they can be or we don't want people butting into our lives. And Paul says, 
put all that, put all that rubbish aside because that'll kill you. If you live isolated, that will kill you. I know some of the, some of the, uh, the best relationships my wife has, who my wife's in her mid thirties are ladies who are two and three decades older than her. And that's how it's supposed to be. Now she has friends her own age too, but, but that's how it's supposed to be. And it's not that, that younger ladies, you're to go to an older lady's house and sit down at her kitchen table while she instructs you. <laughs> it's that you're to share your lives together in such a way where you get a church full of moms, a church full of older sisters. And older ladies, you get a church full of daughters. And Paul says, your lives belong to each other. And to separate it not only is harmful, it's disobedient. It's disobedient. We'll talk more about that in the coming weeks. Paul then addresses another group of men, young men. I think he does that on purpose because he addresses old men, young men, and old women. He never speaks directly to younger women. He just says they're to be in discipling relationships with older women. But I think he speaks to young men on purpose because of what he tells them. He tells them the very thing that they're known for not doing, being self-controlled. He says, young men, be self-controlled. Again, the very thing that young men are not known for doing is be self-controlled because when an older man neglects this responsibility, when an older woman neglects to disciple a younger woman, when a younger woman neglects to follow the ways of God, when a young man is not self-controlled, Titus is, Paul is telling us the word of God gets stomped on. It gets flung in the dirt. It gets reviled it's made to look bad. People say all the time they don't come to church because of church people, right? We've all heard that. And that ought to sting us because at, on one hand, yes, we're a church full of sinners, but we ought to be a church full of sinners that knows it and is honest about it. And we ought to say, yeah, you're right, church people stink, but man, come meet the Savior. And he's on display he talks to employees. He uses the word slaves. The modern application of that would be employee. He says, if you work for somebody, do it as an act of worship. Don't talk back to them. Don't be rude. Don't steal. The way in which you work for your employer is a way to honor the word of God, to make God look good. That's what he says there in chapter 2, um, verse, verse 9. Bond servants. You're to be submissive to your master in everything. They are to be well-pleasing, not argumentative, not pilfering, but showing all good faith. Why? So that in everything they may adorn, they may make beautiful the doctrine of God our Savior. So he says the way in which we live, every aspect of it matters. Old men have a job. Old women have a job. Young women have a job. Young men have a job. Employees have a job. That pretty much gets us all. We have a job to, to make beautiful the things of God by how we live. Which makes sense because what did Paul say about false teachers? They make ugly the word of God by how they what? Live. It says they profess to know God but deny him in their works. Christians, here's what Paul says to us in chapter 3, verse 8. He says, this saying is trustworthy. I want you to insist on these things, Titus, so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. Unlike false teachers who talk out of one side of their mouth and say, I know God, I'm a Christian, I believe, and then out of the other side of their mouth, they deny it all by showing themselves to really love the world lie, slander, get drunk, become addicted to things that, that uh, harm them. He says false teachers, and that doesn't mean just somebody standing up teaching like this. It means somebody who claims Christ in any capacity. False teachers speak out of one side of their mouth and say something else out of the other. Paul says true believers profess God with their words and then make him look beautiful with their actions. 
which is why I began with elders. Before you ever listen to the, to the authoritative teaching of a man, you look at whether he's making God look beautiful with his life. Because if he's not, don't even listen to him. Shut him up, is what Paul said. So just to conclude real quick, Paul says all of these things, all of these things are from a ministry that's grounded in the word of God. That's why a church should love the Bible, hold to the Bible, test everything by the Bible, be Bible-centered about everything, because it matters. It matters. Chapter 2, verse 11, Paul says, The grace of God has appeared to us, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, training us to live self-controlled, upright, godly lives in the present age, awaiting, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our God and Savior Jesus Christ, who himself gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are eager, who are zealous to do good works. He says, tell the true gospel and rebuke with all authority. Hold up Christ crucified because that's the only message. Hold up Christ crucified and raised because that's the only hope. And then live in such a way that puts that on display. Before he tells us that we are to devote ourselves to good works in chapter 3 verse 8. Back in chapter 3 verse 4 Paul says this. When the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us. He saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy. He didn't save us because we earned it. He saved us because he's merciful. And he did it by washing, uh, the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Paul says, it's all God. He said this before a bunch of times. He said in Romans, he said in Corinthians, he said in Ephesians, he said in Galatians and Colossians. God saves us. God justifies us. God sends the Holy Spirit to work this stuff in us. And then how do we know? We know we're not saved by our works. We know we're hoping for eternal life that Jesus will bring to us at the end of time. And he says, all these things are trustworthy. And he says, Titus, insist on them. Why? so that those who believed God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. You see, Christians don't work because we want God to approve of us. Christians do good works because we know God approves of Jesus Christ and we are found in him through faith. We don't work to gain his approval because we never would. We work for him because he has saved us in Christ Jesus. Amen? So Paul says, get your teachers right and then get to teaching because it matters. So let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for another chance to gather to hear your word. Father, we thank you for the letter to Titus. We thank you for all that it teaches, all that it represents, all that it... uh, exposes to us. Father, I pray that as a church, as we study this book in depth, that you will use this in our lives, that we might see, that we might taste, that we might know the goodness of God that is in Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father, for telling us who the church is, how she's to be structured, who's to lead her, what he's to look like, what he's not to look like. Father, we thank you for protecting us in those ways. Lord, we thank you that you saved us by the mercy of Jesus Christ, even when we didn't want it, we didn't deserve it, we didn't work for it. But Father, because of your great mercies, you have saved us in Christ Jesus. And so we give you all the honor, all the glory, and all the praise in the name of Christ our King. Amen.